Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! David Cameron has said he believes he was acting in the public interest when he lobbied ministers and senior civil servants on behalf of the collapsed financial company Greensill Capital. The former Prime Minister, giving evidence to MPs conducting inquiries into the affair, faced a series of uncomfortable questions this afternoon. But he again insisted he had not broken any rules. Our political editor, Laura Koonsberg, was watching. Money, power and how it moves around. The former Prime Minister used his phone book to push the case for his employer along to the Treasury, to the Bank of England, arguing for a now failed city farm, Greensill Capital, to take part in emergency loans last year. David Cameron's role was hidden from view. The texts and emails emerged after weeks of relative silence. So too has he. This is a painful day. Admitting at the start, he could have acted differently, but adamant he did nothing wrong. Nothing I did was in breach of the rules. But on the wider test of, of what is appropriate, as I've said previously, it would be better only to use the most formal means of contact via a letter. David Cameron went to work for Greensill after leaving office. Last year, he appealed repeatedly to former colleagues for the firm to be part of a scheme giving out emergency loans. Lobbying is allowed, but it's meant to be transparent. And there were nearly 60 attempts to get in touch. A message to the Chancellor. Rishi, David Cameron here. Can I have a very quick word? Call any time. And then his old friend, Michael Gove. Do you have a moment? I'm on this number and very free. The Treasury rejected the request, but Greensill, which has now gone under, was allowed to give out millions of pounds of government back loans through a separate scheme. MPs this afternoon were determined to wrinkle Mr Cameron's smooth reputation. Do you not feel that you have demeaned yourself and your position by WhatsApping your way around Whitehall? What I did at the time of economic crisis was put to the government what I genuinely believed to be a good idea for how to get money into the hands of small businesses. It's been an embarrassing afternoon for the man who used to run the country, coy about how much he was being paid or how often he used the company's jet. But David Cameron did deny that he knew that Greensill was in big trouble at the beginning of the pandemic when he was sending all of those texts. And they're more like stalking than lobbying. Looking back, aren't you at least a little bit embarrassed about the way you behaved? We thought we had a good idea. I was keen to get it in front of government. But as I've said, there are lessons to learn and lessons for me to learn. There are several investigations into Greensill, but the firm's failure begs questions about how influence, as well as money, can be part of trade. Laura Kunzberg, BBC News, Westminster. It was a painful day, said David Cameron, as he was hauled before MPs to answer for his role in the collapse of the financial firm Greensill. He relentlessly lobbied the Chancellor and a string of other ministers on behalf of the company last summer. He admitted he wouldn't do that again, but insists he didn't break any rules. The former Prime Minister refused to say how much he was paid for all his work, though he did reveal he used the corporate jet. Our economics correspondent, Helia Ebrahimi, has more. David Cameron, uh, very good to be with you, former Prime Minister. Three months Thank into the scandal that cost his reputation, Cameron was up. This is a painful day, coming back to a place that I love and respect so much, albeit virtually, um, but in these circumstances. Dex Greenhill, Dex, where are you? Give us a wave. Thank you very much. The relationship between Cameron and the failed financier has spawned eight investigations and put into question the very nature of the ties between politicians and their commercial interests. In a humbling appearance where Cameron dressed up his persistent lobbying as civic duty, not greed, his financial interests and texting fell under the spotlight. There's been all sorts of speculation in the press, some people saying that you've suggested to friends you could, if everything went the right way, uh, make a gain of about £60 million. But well, I was paid an annual amount, a generous annual amount, far more than what I earned as Prime Minister, and I had uh, shares. I, you know, was absolutely had a big economic investment in the future of Greensill. Many people would conclude that at the time of your lobbying, your opportunity to make a large amount of money was under threat, and that your fear of losing out on those substantial gains motivated you to conduct this barrage of texts. WhatsApps, emails, meetings, 
over 60 contacts in total towards government ministers and civil servants. I have spent most of my adult life in public service. I believe in it deeply. I would never put forward something that I didn't think was absolutely in the interests of the public good. So what about the private planes, okay. Mr Cameron? Finally, how many times did you use one of the Greensill's fleet of private planes to fly to or from uh, Newquay, close to your third home? Um, I haven't got a complete record of uh, the use of, of planes. I mean, it was used quite a lot by Lex Greensill and senior managers and sometimes myself on business visits. And I did use it a handful of times on uh, other visits. And of course, all proper taxes and all those things would be dealt with in the proper way. Working capital has the ability to make or break businesses. And the big questions MPs kept returning to was when did Cameron first know about Greensill's deteriorating finances? Cameron started lobbying Treasury in March 2020, just as the Bank of England noted weakness in Greensill's business. Two of its biggest clients went into administration, leading one of its insurance to part company with the finance firm. By July, Greensill's main insurance backer warned it would not renew cover. Without insurance, the company could no longer access financial markets, and ultimately it meant its collapse. But today, Cameron stuck to his line, that despite attending boardroom meetings all through last year's difficulties, he knew nothing of the company's troubles until December. Just to be absolutely clear, I did not believe in March or April uh, when I was doing this contact, that there was a risk of Greensill falling over. But I am 100% clear that my motivation for contacting the government is that I thought we had good ideas to help with the credit crisis. But the former Prime Minister wasn't 100% clear on a number of other questions. I don't recall particular discussions on the insurance issue. I don't recall that particular conversation. As I say, I, I don't think I was aware of the deadline. Leaving some members of the committee I mean, frustrated. I mean, as a former Prime Minister, um, it seems like you either conveniently turned a blind eye on things or you didn't do the due diligence properly or you didn't have proper oversight. Cameron and his texting will face further scrutiny in the coming months and it's hard to see how his reputation will ever recover. Well, tonight we have some new information too. The taxpayers' exposure to Greensill has been a point of major debate. First, because of the funds Cameron tried to secure through the Bank of England and Treasury, which were ultimately rejected. But also because we know Greensill was an accredited lender through the British Business Bank. After Greensill's collapse, the bank had told journalists that when there was non-compliance with the rules, guarantees were withdrawn. But under a freedom of information request made by us, we've got confirmation that those guarantees still remain in place. That taxpayer liability of up to £400 million will worry many concerned with Greensill's lending practices. And under, our freedom of, under the freedom of information request, we've also learned that other government departments linked to Greensill, including UK Export Finance, that's a significant prize because it provides UK exporters with loans and guarantees and has a balance sheet of £50 billion. We understand it was approached by Greensill but never went through with any funding, but it gives you some insight perhaps into Greensill's ambitions. Helia Brahimi reporting there. Now, David Cameron's much-anticipated questioning by MPs about his lobbying for a finance company was feisty, if not to say fiery. The former Prime Minister himself kept his cool, insisting he hadn't broken the rules. He acknowledged, though, he should have written to, not texted, members of the government. He refused to say how much he'd been paid. One MP said those texts were more like stalking than lobbying. Another said Greensill Capital had used him and his reputation was now in tatters. Lobbying, he once predicted, would be the next big scandal, and today it was. He seemed uncomfortable playing the starring role. This is a painful day, coming back to a place that I love and respect so much, albeit virtually, um, but in these circumstances. Painful for a man who for six years lived here. Painful too for the MPs trying to get answers. Can you tell us something about what you would expect to have gained 
had the uh, your uh, involvement gone to plan? Well, I was paid a annual amount, a generous annual amount, far more than what I earned as prime minister, and I had uh, shares. But I don't think the amount is particularly germane to answering those questions. And as far as I'm concerned, it's a private matter. The man who he was working for was a familiar face. When David Cameron was Prime Minister, Lex Greensill was a Downing Street advisor. When Mr Cameron left office, he went to work for Lex Greensill in March last year, lobbying the Health Secretary, as well as the Chancellor and two Treasury Ministers, all over a government loan scheme for businesses during the pandemic. Do you not feel that you have demeaned yourself and your position by WhatsApping your way around Whitehall on the back of a fraudulent enterprise. What I did at the time of economic crisis was put to the government what I genuinely believed to be a good idea for how to get money into the hands of small businesses and get their bills paid early. And I've read your 56 messages uh, and they're more like stalking than lobbying. Looking back, aren't you at least a little bit embarrassed about the way you behaved? There are lessons to learn and lessons for me to learn and in future the single formal email or formal letter um, would be appropriate but okay. it was a particular I think it's it's easy to forget now just what a sort of time of economic shock it was. Many of us don't forget there were thousands of people dying at the time. Given that situation, the informal tone of many messages surprised MPs, including one text to the top official in the Treasury. You signed off one of your texts to him, you know, love DC, um, which was the only one that you signed off, sort of love DC. So, I mean, anyone I um, know even at all well, I tend to sign off text messages with love DC. I don't know why I just do. He insists he broke no rules, but his lobbying activities will undoubtedly overshadow his legacy as Prime Minister. Libby Vina, News at 10, Westminster.